Welcome to the EOB podcast, where we talk about the weekend box office and the new openings this week. I'm Beno, and joining me is Sen Duong. So, Sen, you there? Yeah, I'm here. So, hey, um, you know about this big blizzard, uh, snowstorm happening in the East Coast, uh, which probably affected the box office somewhat? Yeah, I mean, with hundreds of theaters, if not more, closed down during this storm, you know, I'm sure it affects the business. Oh, right. Every movie at the box office is affected. I mean, I heard the drop off 7 to 10 percent or something like that, or maybe higher. Yeah, yeah. That's what people are mentioning. When theaters are closed down, it's just people aren't sure how much it affected the business. Right. I mean, there are a lot of people over in the East Coast, the population yeah. density, and, you know, those people would go to watch movies uh, over the weekend as well. So I'm sure there's like a lot of business loss. I mean, remember a couple of years ago, there was the big hurricane the government warned that people should stay inside even if it's open you know it's not safe to go out the snowstorm is the same thing so i don't know we should take these numbers you know with a grain of salt or there's some should be some asterisks with the numbers that we're going to go through uh, this week yeah in the east coast the main market is definitely new york when theaters in new york have to close down it you know it affects everything especially uh art house movies that's one of the biggest markets and, you know, and New York is one of the biggest markets for uh, films. Oh, sure. Not just New York, and but, the, na- yeah, but yeah, the neighboring, yeah, but the neighboring states also, yeah, yeah. N- New Jersey, you know, other stuff, Maine, you know, Rhode Island, not an uh, insignificant uh, number of people. <laughs> right. All right. How about we jump right in? Okay, sure. Okay. Coming in number one uh, last weekend is The Revenant, the... Uh, Leo DiCaprio survival. I don't know what 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 do you describe it. It's an action thriller, uh, where he she plays a uh, character who is left for dead by his team, and he went and seek those people out. And of course, the famous scene is that uh, he got mauled by a bear. And uh, this movie is holding up extremely well. It did drop by fifty percent over the weekend. So, <laughs> well, and, of course. Well, you know, if we look down the list, the drop off is huge. The snowstorm does have some effect. Comparatively, it, it did okay. Uh, it made uh, about sixteen million over the weekend, mm. and it's nearing one hundred and twenty million uh, in five weeks. It's doing pretty well. The only, I guess, negative here is that its budget is pretty huge, one hundred and thirty-five million. You know, it'll definitely make more than one hundred and thirty-five million uh, in terms of profits. It'll have to do well overseas, which was with all these Oscar nominations and with Leonardo DiCaprio. It's already doing pretty well. Uh, overseas has made 104 million so far. And the worldwide figure is at 224 million, which is, you know, pretty good. I also have to mention that The Revenant is one of those rare movies that didn't open in number one, you know, when it went wide, but it became the number one movie over time, which is uh, uh, yeah. pretty rare. Yeah. Okay, at number two is Star Wars, The Force Awakens. It's second place this week. Uh, last week, it was third place. So the snowstorm, <laughs> I guess, helped the revenant in Star Wars, The Force Awakens. The drop-off is 46%. You know, if you take out the 10%, it's probably around 40%, which isn't too bad for Star Wars. And the total so far is $880 million, And it's still chugging along. At this pace, you know, it'll definitely not reach uh, $1 billion in the U.S., yeah, but it, it looks like it's on track to cross 900 million, yeah. uh, which is quite a feat itself. Yeah, it'll probably hit in uh, two weeks. But the worldwide figure is at 1.94 billion. So it doesn't look like it'll beat Titanic or Avatar's worldwide box office. Well, but Titanic made that money over time. It got re-released numerous times. You know, ah, Star yeah, Wars yeah, The Force yeah. Awakens might not be able to break it, that record now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's not going to no. break that record now. But it no. could once Star Wars The Force Awakens gets re-released to promote the other movies. They could have a marathon thing going, which yeah, could add to its tally. It could, but I'm not sure, though, because, um, I mean, with, with Titanic and Avatar, there's a reason for the re-release. Um, and the, re- the reasoning was the 3D conversion when 3D was big. But even that... You know, the 3D effect, they were too late when, you know, when they started doing the 3D conversion, 3D has already tapered off. And even the, the previous Star Wars we released, there were reasons for rewatching them because George Lucas updated the effects for most of and, those films. And made a few cuts. <laughs> yeah, made a few cuts. With this one, the only thing is, hey, we're going to do a marathon. And, you know, Star Wars, they've done marathons in the past and they didn't make that much more. 
Okay, that's yeah. fair. That's fair. Uh, unless they decide to make another cut of the Force Awakens or some yeah. technological change. Uh, yeah. So they might not re or they might not make as much uh, doing a re-release. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's move along to Ride Along Two coming in at number three. It pulled in about thirteen million over the weekend. Experienced a sixty-three percent drop off. Wow! In two weeks, it nearing the sixty million mark on a budget of forty million. Yeah, it's going to be a very profitable film. Though I think the only problem is it'll make nowhere near as much as the first film. Uh, the first film, I think, how much did they make? Around one hundred and thirty or one hundred and forty total. And this one looks like at its current pace will have trouble reaching a hundred million. Yeah, you you mentioned last week last week that uh, you know Ride Along Two is is not going to be as leggy as the first movie. Yeah, and it has the typical African American drop off, sixty plus percent. So, which is one of those things where you wonder how much the East Coast storm has affected it, because this drop off is kind of typical. And if you take out the ten percent, it would be at fifty eight percent or fifty seven percent. Even at sixty percent, is kind of normal for African American demographic. Yeah, I think the uh, East Coast storm it affects all the major uh, releases equally. I think, right? I mean, the reviews <laughs> is the pretty poor at at twelve yeah, percent. <laughs> so you can say it's a quality comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And even the audience score wasn't as high because with Why Along, the first one, it was poorly reviewed too. But you know, not twelve percent. It was like around thirty-five percent or something. No, I think Ride Along Two was only a few percentage points better, like eighteen or something like that. Oh, and you mean Ride Along? Ride Along was only at eighteen percent. Yeah, yeah. Ride Along was only at eighteen. Let oh, me okay. let me confirm that. Let me confirm it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so it's not that much better. Okay. Yeah, eighteen percent. Okay. All right. My bad. But the uh, the cinema score for the first one was definitely better. The cinema score for the first one was at A, and this one is like. B or B minus or mm -hmm. somewhere around there. So the the word of mouth is definitely not as good as the first film. Yeah, true. Maybe the problem with sequel is that they get uh, more of the same. I think. Mm -hmm. but I think maybe the word of mouth there saying, hey, you know, you seen the first movie. There's not a lot of reason to watch the second movie, even though I said that they kind of up everything uh, for the sequel. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, Miami. So mm -hmm. oh, they added Olivia Munn, Kim Jong. Uh, so they added more comedians, they added more eye candy, but uh, maybe the joke is not as fresh as the first movie. Why? Right, yeah. yeah. Or it could be that a producer was right all along, maybe Kevin Hart. It's not that funny. <laughs> maybe his social media powers are not working anymore. Yeah, but he's still drawing a crowd. Just he might be oversaturating himself because he's pumped out a bunch of films in the last year. Oh right, so he's kind of like the Samuel L. Jackson of comedians. Yeah, except yeah, I mean Samuel L. Jackson would do like supporting characters, and that's how he can crank out that many films. Kevin Hart is like the main draw in these films. Right, right. Uh, how about we move on to number four, one of the new openings uh, last weekend. It's uh, Thirty Grandpa. It made um, eleven point five million. It did about where you think it would do, right? You said about ten million. Yeah, the interesting thing is four to six. All three uh, wide releases last week made about the same. They were around eleven million. Uh, Thirty Grandpa, The Boy, The Fifth Wave. What were we predicting with all three films? I think we were all kind of around that area. Well, yeah, we. Well, I had it. Uh, the the movies a bit higher. For example, The Fifth Wave, I had it around fifteen. I thought it would get the new movie bump because of the special effects. Yeah, it wasn't too far off. It, yeah, it went about ten point seven. Yeah, you weren't too far off. Yeah, it was just that we just weren't that high on the new releases. Let's get back to Thirty Grandpa. You know, we thought okay. that Robert De Niro, Zach Efron as comedic leads probably won't do as well. And then you say that De Niro as this um, old guy who's getting it on with young college students, my, kind of border, my, borderline creepy and I mean, icky. My, yeah, yeah, icky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was over the edge of what we would, as a general audience, would accept. I think I was at ten. You were at fifteen. I think we both had around ten. I think we agree on everyone except for the fifth wave, right? Right, right. We we're both kind of really white on the mark there. Yeah. So in general, I think people felt the same as us. Despite De Niro's work in comedies, he was just the supporting character. He wasn't like the main, one of the main comedic leads. And Zach Efron. Again, I think in the same boat as De Niro. 
good as the supporting character in a comedy, but not as the comedic lead. Yeah, right. They're good as a person that the other comedians can play off of. I mean, you wouldn't make a movie with uh, Tommy Lee Jones and put him as the main comedic draw. You only put him in there because Will Smith can play off of him. And that's true. And I have to point out that uh, Dory Grandpa is the second film, you know, it's a, a Zac Efron movie that didn't do well. There was a time when he's doing these uh, musicals and, and romances. That he was actually a decent draw. His films would open to like, you know, 18 million, 20 million. Uh, but now it seems like he no longer has that draw. No, well, he was a teenage heartthrob. Yeah. And then uh, he had to make the transition into a, um, I don't know, I, I had a romantic lead, I guess. Yeah. And I think this movie is just not right for him. Or, you know, maybe people are tired of him playing this same role, you know, like this young hot guy with girls. Even DJ is, you know, young hot guy with girls. You know, maybe he needs to pull a Leo if he has, you know, that kind of talent. <laughs> <laughs> Going through oh. other worlds. All right. You know, he might have to start relying less on his looks and more on talent, if he has any. <laughs> um, you know what? Looking by his um, upcoming movies, uh -huh. um, it seems like he's still going by his looks. Later this year, in May, it's Neighbors 2. Uh, that's okay, because it was a hit. It was a hit, but uh, again, it's, was it's Seth with Rogen. Seth, yeah, Seth Rogen. Yeah. Uh, and then in 2017, the uh, highly anticipated Baywatch movie. Oh, okay. See, that that, that kind of will my work because <laughs> it's kind of tailor-made <laughs> for, for guys like him. <laughs> right, I could right. see Baywatch working. But I, I don't know. The, the only thing is, you know, Bay, Baywatch have, you know, come and gone. I'm not sure if people still care about a Baywatch movie, but I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. They might not care about Beige Watch movie, but they probably care about Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Oh, he's in it too? He's in it. That's interesting. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you throw The Rock in something, it's gonna, it makes it just a whole lot more interesting. That, there you go. There you, you can prove that his yeah. box office power uh, uh, yeah. with the Beige Watch movie. He, they'll right. watch him in anything. Although with uh, San Andreas, I, I can see, even though it was a decent sized hit, he has his limitations. I thought in San Andreas there was too much of the walk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll see um, if um, his uh, popularity tapers off or not. Right. All right, let's move on to number five, The Boy, the second of the three wide releases last weekend. Made 11.3 million with a budget of 10 million, so it's a solid hit. It's a whole movie about a doll, kind of like Annabelle. It's in the long line of horror movies where, you know, you break the rules and you get punished for it. Kind of like gremlins, right? Don't feed that critter after midnight. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, the boy is, uh, you know, in the tradition of, of those kind of movies. And I think I had it, the movie to do around, open to around six million, even less than that. It did better than what I thought it would do. And, uh, you know, because it pretty much stars nobody, as horror movies tend to do, right? I mean, yeah. they, they that's how are, they can make it so cheaply. Exactly. It's like uh, they don't pay anybody. Uh, the money all goes into the sets and whatever have you and, um, what, and you know, perform well, I, I guess, relatively yeah. speaking. Yeah, what, what did I have it at? Was I low or high? I think you were about uh, 10 million as well, or maybe, oh. uh, you know, ar around there. It's another film in the current trend of let's make these less bloody horror movies, or like horror movies that you can bring the family to, like The Conjuring and Annabelle. It's kind of a good trend because it's one of those things where we used to have torture porn and we used to have lots of blood and now we're going into movies where it's more about the creepy atmosphere rather than blood and TNA and torture. <laughs> right, but you know these trends come and go, it's yeah. like after a couple of these kind of movies, uh, audience will demand, oh, come on, we want harder core Yeah, we stuff. want old-fashioned, we want old-fashioned horror, you know, give us blood, guts, and TNA. I, I kind of like this trend. Yeah, right, people have to work yeah. to get their scares instead of just, oh, just throw in some yeah. ketchup, a lot of ketchup. Yeah, uh, or some hot babe with big right. bosoms. Yeah, and hot babes with big bosom in ketchup, you know, for <laughs> yeah. example. Right. And getting torture. <laughs> right, right, so... The Boy is, like I said, a typical January horror movie, which, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's a low budget. It's going to make its money. It's going to make most of its money on home video. 
Uh, true, and you know, and the horror movies are typically jumping off points for starlets, aspiring actresses. Yeah. You know, Jennifer Aniston was in horror movies. Jennifer Lawrence right. was in, you know, these horror movies. It's like how people get to start. So horror movies are good. <laughs> right. And you know they're gonna make the boys two, three, and four uh, on demand. All right. <laughs> okay, let's move on to number six, the other new release, The Fifth Wave. It stars Coley Morez. It's based on a YA novel about invading aliens that takes over people's bodies. Uh, I pulled in about 10.7 million uh, over the weekend. And um, the budget is 38, which surprises me. I thought it would cost more uh, in the 70 million range. And, yeah, you know, yeah. this is, yeah, and The Fifth Wave is the movie that I thought would do better than the rest of the new openings, but it actually did worse. I wasn't too high on it either. I was thinking 10 million too. The East Coast storm kind of affected everything. Even if you add 10% to the fifth wave, it would still not be good enough. But the budget is pretty modest. And if they're thinking about, I think I read everywhere that they were thinking about launching this as a, the next you know, YA franchise. And that's 10.7 million. It's not going to launch a franchise. It'll, it's going to have trouble uh, recouping as a modest 38 million budget. Well, domestically, at least, right? I mean, yeah, domestically, still have yeah. the overseas. I mean, overseas right now, it's at 27 million. Uh, um, yeah, which is not bad. So it might make money eventually worldwide. If it makes 120 million worldwide, then they'll make sequels. But if it makes 80, they'll probably go direct to video or they'll make a TV show out of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the, what is that, the um, City of Bones? It didn't do well enough in theaters to launch a franchise, but they ended up turning it into a TV show. Well, here's the thing. I think some books or whatever are better as a, a TV show, you know, instead of a movie. You know, it's just mm. like some, some movies or some stories need longer format to tell. Yeah, yeah that's true. And especially, I think YA novels is like when you cast these nobodies or characters, like young actors, it's, it's hard. Um, to cast yep. young actors because they don't they they're not experienced with the craft. I think the CW uh, is the CW network still around. <laughs> I, I believe so. Okay, if they are, that that would be the perfect uh, channel or the perfect network for these kind of uh, these kind of films, YA films. It's like the perfect demographic. Right, right. But that's what I'm I'm saying. It's like young actors in movies are kind of dicey because like it's hard to really find young actors that are really good. Mm -hmm. and able to carry a film. But the pro is that they're cheap. Still, you need to pull in people. The cheap does not yeah. mean, you know, you're just throwing good money out with the bad. <laughs> yeah, there has to be a balance. Some studios balance it by, uh, you know, you hire these young new actors, but you round them out with seasoned vets who are not big office, box office draws, but who are um, really good actors and have respectability. Kind kind of like what Michael Bay does with his action movies. He hire Oscar winning actors to you know do supporting roles just to add some credibility. If the budget is true, you have thirty eight million to work with, right? I think most of the stuff went into the special effects, and you know I don't think you can hire any seasoned vets. <laughs> like you, I'm surprised this movie look a lot more expensive than thirty eight million. So I'm kind of impressed. Unless all the effects that they showed us are in the trailer and they only last a couple minutes. Uh, it could be, and that could explain yeah. the uh, weekend the opening number. Monster. But we know that there won't be a sixth wave. <laughs> right. It depends. If, if it gets to 120 million worldwide, we might see a sixth wave. Okay, overseas again. You know, it's that yeah, overseas, overseas market. Those darn overseas yeah. market. <laughs> yeah. A forty million budget. If it makes three times its budget worldwide, they'll probably crank out a sequel. All right, <laughs> and that's what we uh, will keep an eye on. All right, let's move on to number seven. Thirteen hours. The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. It's the uh, Michael Bay film, and his take on what happened in Benghazi. It focused on the I, I think um, contractors working in Benghazi at the time. Uh, as we said, uh, Michael Bay loves the military. When everything went wrong, it's these soldiers try to do the right thing. Other than the big short, this is the best hole in, of all the films in the top 10. Um, okay, and, and I have an explanation for that. Let me hold, uh, hold you there for a bit. Okay. okay. It made uh, 9.7 million over the weekend. Um, in two weeks, it pulled in, well, is it two weeks? Yeah, it pulled in about yeah. 33 million. Um, budget is 50. Okay, and the explanation is that um, this movie is uh, not affected by the East Coast storm because this movie plays well in the States. 
that are not affected by the blizzard, which is like the uh, you know middle the country. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. That's explain the lowest drop off. Yeah, that could be, and it's playing well with the conservative crowd. East Coast is more liberal, so you're, you're right. That's probably why it's holding up pretty well. At this pace, it looks like you'll reach 50 million, and you'll probably make its money on home video. As with Michael Bay films, they'll probably do uh, decent overseas. And that's true. Even though it doesn't have any transforming robots, Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an action movie, and action movies are easy to translate overseas, and it plays well overseas, and it'll probably do decent. Overseas. Right, that's that's true too. It's, it's kind of like uh, the cliff notes of Benghazi for the overseas market. Like it, what ha happened yeah. there, and people are gonna watch this movie, and they can uh, uh, they, uh, they pick don't up care all the action that. too. They're just gonna go, oh, Michael Bay. We're gonna see lots of explosions. Okay, let's yeah. move on to uh, number eight, Daddy's Home, uh, the uh, Will Ferrell and uh, Mark Wahlberg comedy. Did 5.3 million over the weekend, about 45 percent drop off, and. After five weeks, it's at uh, 139 million, one of the two stars' highest grossing films. At number nine, Norm of the North uh, at 4.1 million. As any family film, 40% drop off is not bad, especially with the Blizzard. After two weeks, it's at 14 million, and it's another animated film released by Lionsgate. They did a uh, uh, Shaun of the Sheep. And Norm of the North looks like it could be another one of those films where they got the rights for. Know, a couple million and if it makes 15 million they they might make some money i mean it didn't make it definitely didn't make an impression and the reviews were uh, horrible right i think it's pretty bad <laughs> yeah the norm of the north is typical landscape before yeah. their twilight series it's like they acquire these um, you know horror movies in this case animation for cheap and they release yeah. it and they, they make money and yeah. if it, I went on to do bigger, better things, then they can, the producers can crank another one and they can get the rights to that. Uh, you know, this is like before they hit it big, you know, they acquired these cheap movies and then they released it and they, it makes money for them. And then they build up this war chest until they can acquire, yeah. you know, better material. Yeah, right. Before they hit it big with the Twilight, well, the Twilight was from a studio they eventually bought, but, you know, they're popular for uh, these genre films. And now it looks like they're trying to move into animation. And they're doing it the conservative fuga way, like you said. Pay a couple mm -hmm. million. If it makes money, it makes money. If not, it's only a couple million. Right, right. Okay, uh, uh, let's round out the top 10 with the big short. It made 3.5 million over the weekend, and in seven weeks, it rose about 56 million. Of all the films in the top 10, it's the one that held up the best. The drop off is only 34%. This is the Oscar movie, the limited release movie that, that actually broke out. Because most of the other films are around 40 million, and even uh, the Securio, which made like 43 million. Spotlight uh, did 33, which is pretty impressive. It's way better than Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs didn't even end up making cracking 20 million. Uh, right. I think the big short right now is the indie movie to beat. Uh, all yeah. the momentum is with this movie because um, because it's the most recent, <laughs> yeah. and it probably did the best out of all of them too, and it's getting all the buzz right now. Spotlight could challenge it, but right now, yeah, the the big show is definitely the one to beat. Well, you have to uh, think about which um, studio is behind which movie. Uh, the big short has Paramount. Spotlight is Open Road Films. Yeah, with Paramount, they definitely have more money to spend on their uh, Oscar campaign. Right. See any any other movies? Oh yes, uh, I give a shout out to Ip Man Three. Yeah, the Donnie Yen movie that uh, also features uh, uh, Mike Tyson in a, uh, a limited role. He's just a person there for uh, Donnie Yen, the star of the film, to uh, fight. Right, he's um, the punching bag, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's the guy low that he needs to beat. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and, you know, they, they opened it about a month after it debuted in Asia. And like most of the Chinese films uh, recently, they've been opening it a lot closer to their original release dates in Asia. And this one did pretty well, 762,000 at 103 screens. And of all of the films on the list, it has the highest per screen average at $7,400. So it did pretty good. I mean, compared to Ip Man 2, which was released nearly a year after it debuted in Asia. Mm -hmm. That movie made two hundred, about two hundred thousand dollars total, 
So this one in one weekend has already made nearly four times that. And I'm sure uh, Donnie Yen has been promoting it in the US too, so that helps a lot. But again, like most of the Chinese films recently, releasing it uh, closer to their original release dates in Asia helps a lot. Right, right. I also like to make a point about um, Donnie Yen. I think the reason for his longevity now that Jackie Chang and Jet Li has kind of ceded uh, their places uh, to him, and, and you know, is another reason is that he kind of introduced all these kind of different fighting styles into into his movies. Right. I uh, recently caught up with Special ID, and that movie he introduced like uh, MMA into the fight scenes. It started with SPL. Well, that's true, but I haven't seen SPL, so I, I'm not okay, up to right. date on him. You know, I, I can see you know why people would go to these kind of movies, even though it's like, oh, it's another martial arts movie from the end. But you know, the fight scene sort of thing, right? And he introduces all these things. It's not like Wire Fu and you know Wing Chun and all the all those other things, right? It's, it's more natural to these modern uh, fighting styles now. I, I think. Um, so he did introduce MMA into uh, his fight choreography with uh, SPL, and then later uh, Flashpoint. Mm -hmm. I think people have higher regard for those two films than Special ID. Although Special ID is a solid martial arts movie, uh, but I, I think people have higher regard for SPO and, and Flashpoint. He's the first to introduce it in these uh, martial arts movies, and he's he's also, the I think, the only one who does it really well. After SPO and Flashpoint, uh, other martial artists uh, have tried to incorporate it into their films, but I don't think uh, they've done it as well. It, didn't, it doesn't look as exciting. They either go too realistic and make it look like an actual MMA fight, which is pretty boring. <laughs> Whereas Donnie Yen, he has the Hong Kong flavor, the Hong Kong flash that makes these fight scenes look exciting. Yeah, I mean, you know? there's still the flashy kicks, the jumps, uh, the whatever that make the hallmark Hong Kong fight scenes, right? But he yeah. introduced these grapplings, you know, tackles, uh, well, et cetera. And, uh, you know, Donnie Yen, Besides an actor and then you know martial artist is also a choreographer too, so he kind of does everything. Yeah, but with the but Yip Man is more uh, classical style though. Yeah, it's kind of like the Wong Fei Hong style uh, movies. Yeah. yeah, not super stylized, but there's not much MMA in in Yip Man because that's not his style. The style here is mm -hmm. Wing Chun. There's no wire fu or grappling. It's just a, kind of a different fighting style that Bruce Lee used as his uh, foundation. Uh, mostly because it's uh, simple and direct. There's not a lot of flash, but in the film, they're able to make it look very exciting. And, and it is a different fighting technique that you don't see in other films. With Jackie Chan, you know, at the time, relatively speaking, it's a more realistic fighting style. And with Jet Li, he made the more stylized uh, Wushu popular. And then Tony Jaa added uh, Muay Thai. And then was it Aiko Uwe with the Wei films added Indonesian Sila. And mm -hmm. with Yip Man, it's the Wing Chun style. So it's a different fighting style that people don't normally see. And that's probably why these Yip Man films are so popular in uh, Asia. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm specifically focusing on uh, Donnie Yen, it's like he can do all these different styles, right? I mean, what other yeah, yeah, martial yeah. artists, that they're kind of stuck in one type of fighting scene. So their movies get kind of stale, whereas he can mix things up. That's kind of like my uh, tribute to why Donnie Yen is popular because be before he was like overshadowed by uh, Jackie Chan and Jet Li, and now he's become his own Ip Man, for example. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right. Um, one interesting thing is they also opened uh, Monster Hunt uh, this at the same weekend as Ip Man in the U.S. And Monster Hunt is the highest grossing film in China ever. It made three hundred and eighty-five million in China. As I mentioned about the release dates, Monster Hunt was released in Asia last year in July, and they only released it here now. And they made about as much as how other films, uh, what other films made when they were released too far off of the original release dates in Asia. And even the second Yip Man film, uh, when they released it in the U.S., made about 21,000 when it opened in limited screens. And well, actually, it made more than this. It made more. I think it made about 60,000. But still, it's very important for these films that they release them early instead of later, because I'm sure a lot of people have already probably, who wants to see Monster Hunt, have already owned the Blu-ray. Perhaps, but I just yeah. want to point out that uh, for me, Monster Hunt is just not that good of a movie. The special effects and the art style is kind of odd to me. I don't think it will appeal to Western audiences. 
it could be as you say that uh, you know people who've seen who want to see Monster Hunt have already seen it. And I also like to point out that uh, you know Monster Hunt is not that good of a movie, and um, people who are used to special effects movies have seen better. People who are used to see uh, martial arts movie have seen better. So I don't know why this movie is so big <laughs> in China. <laughs> it's probably a combination of all that. It would have probably done better had they released it closer to its original release date. It might have done a lot better, but it might still not have done. In the same range as Iman Three, for instance, Iman Three. I mean, Donnie Yen was at least promoting it in the U.S., and Donnie Yen speaks near perfect English, which a lot of people were actually shocked by. Since he grew up in the U.S., and he called out a career in uh, Hong Kong slash China. Whereas Monster Hunt, the only way they can really promote it is by saying that hey, it's the highest-grossing movie in China ever. They can't actually put a person out there to promote it. Whereas with Yuman Three, Donnie Yen and Mike Tyson was promoting it, you know, in like LA and in talk shows. Right, and any movie with Mike Tyson in it, it's probably a must see. <laughs> you know. Okay, uh, I guess that's it for the box office. How about we move on to the openings? All right, let's start with the biggest one, Kung Fu Panda Three. Only eight reviews so far on Rotten Tomatoes, but uh, it's at eighty-eight percent. Which is pretty good, and the first two Kung Fu Panda movies were well reviewed too, and they're in that part of that DreamWorks category of films that makes around 150 to 200 million range, not the Shrek range, but the How to Train Your Dragon range. Domestically, there there was a drop off. I think the first Kung Fu Panda made a little over 200 million, and the second one made about 165 million. But Uh, worldwide, I think the second one actually made more lossy because it made nearly a hundred million in China, which at the time was the highest-grossing, by far the highest-grossing animated film ever. And with Kung Fu Panda 3, I think it's now、uh, it might be a co-production with China,、mm-hmm. with China's box office growing so much in the past year. It's probably expected to do 200 million in China, plus or minus 20 million. Yeah, I think I expect the third movie to do better、uh, than the second movie because it has more panda. Yeah, in the U.S., it has more pandas.、Uh, the movie, I guess, is about another panda that identified himself as Poe's dad. You know, came and brought him back to their village, and of course, the village get attacked, and Poe needs to train these pandas into, you know,、uh, into a fighting machine. So you、yeah. think because there are more cute pandas, they'll attract more? There are more cute pandas, and I think. Uh, the last Kung Fu Panda Two was released back in 2011,、uh, you know, and how many home video titles? Who knows? But I think、uh, you know people might be ready for more,、um, you know, Kung Fu Pandas. I But I said that before, that. right? I said that before,、yeah. and it didn't pan out. Or <laughs>、yeah. well, pan that out?、Um, right, right. <laughs> that's true.、Um, uh, but I, I, I would disagree with, with you there.、Um, there was a pretty huge drop off from the first film to the second film. Because the first film did 215 million, and the second film only did 165. And in terms of opening, the first film opened to 60 million, and the second film opened only opened to 48 million. I think a big reason why they did Panda 3 was mainly because of China. The second film, on a worldwide basis, actually made about 30 million more than the first film. I think it might continue the trend of not doing as well in, in the U.S., but it'll do a lot better in China. Okay,、um, it's so fair. You put into that.、Uh, I think I'm gonna go for maybe 45 to 50 opening. Reason being is, like I said, people might be more ready、pandas. for more panda, more and more pandas. Don't underestimate cute.、Uh, you know,、yeah. this is not as action packed as the previous movies. I think they are emphasizing comedy this time. Another reason I said they're targeting the Chinese market is they're releasing it near Chinese New Year. But this is usually an odd period to release a family film in the U.S. Maybe it's because the、yeah. summer months are occupied. <laughs> right, because you know?、uh, the previous two films were released during the summer. That's why I don't think it's going to do domestically do as well as the previous two films. They all like to focus on China because Kung Fu Panda Three might be the first film in the series where it might make more in China than in the U.S. That's kind of like a lot of films,、uh, you know,、yeah. big special effect films. So, what kind of numbers are you putting on this movie opening?、Uh, I'm actually putting it、uh, just a slight notch below yours.、Um, I'm thinking like 35 million. Entirely possible. I mean, there could be the、yeah. blizzard could go on for a bit <laughs> longer. <laughs> 
So it might affect the box office, but I'm getting a sense that I think Kung Fu Panda 3 kind of returns to the stuff, the comedy, I guess, the action comedy that makes the first movie so successful. Yeah, it, it, it depends. I mean, the the first two films were actually, even Kung Fu Panda 2 was actually pretty well reviewed. Yeah, in the 80s, like Kung Fu Panda was 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. Kung Fu Panda 2 is uh, 81%. This one looked like it will probably fall in that range too. Going by like historical trends, uh, you, you could be right, kind of like the Alvin and the Chipmunk movies, right? Where each subsequent yeah. movie did uh, less and less. But we'll yeah. see if Kung Fu Panda 3 can move the franchise in, in the right direction. It's not like Kung Fu Panda 2 moved it in the wrong direction. It's because it was decently well reviewed. And especially for sequels, that's very good. Because um, sequels are usually worse reviewed than the originals. Mm-hmm. And this one is only slightly, you know, it's still in the 80% range, which is really good for a sequel. And Kung Fu Panda 3 looks like it'll fall in that range. I don't think that the quality taper off too much. Maybe the draw of it is just not as high. Yeah, that's true. But I'm just saying, don't underestimate the drawing power of pandas, especially when there are lots of them. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be, this could be the minions effect. You know, right. they're like, you know what? People want to see pandas. We'll just give them lots of lots of cute pandas, and it might do better. Right, Who knows? Right. It might be right. All right. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll come back next week, and we'll see how this movie will. Okay, let's move on to Fifty Shades of Black. As you can tell by the title, it's a spoof of Fifty Shades of Grey, that uh, S and M um, romantic movie. <laughs> you can call it that. Yeah, I think the whole way in comedy thing has come and gone. They might need other people to make fun of movies now. Here's the thing, right? Um, the last spoof that one of the Waynes did was uh, a Haunted House two. It had a eight million opening and it grows a lifetime uh, domestic of seventeen million. Yeah, so I'm thinking similar numbers for uh, Fifty Shades of Black. Yeah, but let's build the case. The other spoof came out in 2013, which is The Haunted House. It opened to 18, then huge drop off, and it had a lifetime growth of 40 million. So you know the spoof movie business has been going downhill since. It was just peak for the Wayan brothers anyway with the scary movies. It's no longer a draw anymore. So I'm thinking 50 Shades of Black, 8 to 10 million. Yeah, 10 million opening, just a solid round number. It could do less. And I felt that they picked the wrong movie to spoof. Which and one would you rather spoof? I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't spoof any movie, I guess. I, I think they should do their own comedy I guess, because like this spoof business has been yeah. going downhill for them. It hadn't worked. Yeah, right? you know, if you watch this trailer, it's not that funny. Right, and right. you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is its own comedy. You can, you know, you can look <laughs> at it, and you don't need to spoof it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So okay, you're going less than me. I'm going ten, uh, which is a solid number. Could do less if judging by the haunted house. Right. How about the finest hours? It looks a lot like the Perfect Storm with George Clooney, which did really, really well back then. But I'm not sure about Chris Pine's drawing power by himself. The finest hours takes place in the ocean, right? There's going to be storm. There's going to be a lot of big waves. And as you said, you can see George Clooney's movie in this one. Perfect storm, right? You know, I think he stars as one of the people who is stationed at a remote uh, town and then, you know, has to go out in the ocean to rescue a boat that is trapped um, in a big storm in this tiny boat. The review so far on Rotten Tomatoes is only four. They're all bad. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, and you know, Chris Pine outside of his Star Trek movies, his movie typically open in the 15 million range. Oh, that's actually uh, higher than I thought. I think Jack Ryan was his first one. And Jack Ryan is a really known name franchise. And that only did 15. Uh, this means war did decent. But it opened uh, 17, you know, yeah. there's a definite trend so, there. Yes. Right. Uh, I see Chris Pine as um, kind of like Chris Hemsworth kind of guy. So what are you thinking? It looks like a 10 to 15 range, right? Yeah, I, I see it like kind of 15 million yeah. opening, kind of like typical Chris Pine movie. The trailer actually looks to half decent, so I'll go 12. We'll see uh, the drawing power of Chris Pine, but you know, outside Chris Pine, you don't recognize a lot of people in this movie. So it's just kind of him and Waves. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah, another that uh, movie of note. It's uh, Jane Got a Gun. It's oh, okay. opened Jane in about 500 theaters, 550 theaters, which Almost is wide. 
Yeah, so that is the Natalie Portman Ewan McGregor movie, mm-hmm. a western. So uh, I think uh, Portman's character plays a, a, a widow who hires, I think, McGregor to kill the person who killed her husband. And she got a gun. Know, I, <laughs> yeah, the, the trailer doesn't look that exciting. Like Serena, this is a movie that has a trouble production. I uh, think with, it was supposed to star somebody else and, and then that person left and then they got McGregor in. Or is it Joe Egerton? In any case, uh, it was supposed to be released, I think, a year or two ago. It got mm-hmm. delayed. And uh, oh yeah, and, and the director, the director, mm-hmm. it was uh, supposed to be this female director uh, mm-hmm. who had creative differences and left before production began. And uh, Gavin O'Connor came in, uh, you know, to work this thing out. He's mm-hmm. the guy who directed Warrior, but I'm not sure how much he uh, can improve this movie. So I see a lot of shades of Serena in this movie. You know that movie oh, with uh, Joe- Bradley Cooper yeah. and Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah, wow, well, Joe Egerton had a part in the writing too. That guy's doing everything. That guy's writing, directing. Wait, what was that whole film that he did? Um, the Gift. That he wrote and directed? Yeah, The Gift that did uh, surprisingly well. Maybe he had to to fix the script. So you know, like yeah, I say, uh, this movie had some trouble. The, yeah, and he did do The Warrior uh, with uh, Gavin O'Connor. Yeah. But Gavin oh. O'Connor came in way afterward. You know, like the movie was just about to begin a couple of weeks before oh. that. You know, there was some, so Egerton you, probably talked him into it, I bet. Right, yeah, yeah. This is supposed to be some kind of female empowerment movie, and the trailer just, yeah, the trailer just seemed kind of lifeless. And Natalie Portman, who's usually good in, in her films, it seems miscast as, you know, a woman of power. You watch it, and it doesn't seem like she has that um, Jenny on the block thing going. She doesn't, <laughs> she's not J-Lo. You know, she doesn't seem like the action woman type. Yeah, if you have any complaints, you talk to Natalie Portman because she's a producer of this movie oh. and she probably cast herself. Uh, you know, this is a movie that she um, wants to do herself. Uh, I mean, she's charismatic in her, you know, in her own way, but th- this requires more of a presence. I mean, she has a presence when she's doing her Natalie Portman thing. You know, she seems a little bit too uh, fragile. Well, um, in any case, right, it's a Western... Natalie Portman probably should mix, and they're only releasing it in about 500 theaters. Uh, even yeah, it's probably with, one of those with, contract releases. Yeah, with, with the talents involved, you expect a bigger push, especially mm-hmm. with this white side company behind them. I'm not expecting big things. I'm getting Serena vibes from this movie. Uh, it's a movie that they just want to throw out there and get it over right. with. Uh, it's, it's a sunk cost. Yeah, right. And the two reviews that they have on Rotten Tomatoes so far, pretty bad. And it, it seems like from the comments, it's what you see from the trailer, which is kind of lifeless and it doesn't really make an impression. And Natalie Portman just doesn't have Angelina Jolie or Jennifer Lopez's, you know, action woman thing going. So I'm not expecting big things. If it made yeah, one million, was, great. Yeah, one million, two yeah. million. Yeah. It will just come and go. And kind of like us, I, I didn't even know it's opening until I saw it on a box office mojo. And that's probably how they how the studio uh, would want it to be. It's our goal if you didn't notice that we're even out in theaters. It's probably one of those films where they would be happy just going to Rex video and mm-hmm. try to recoup whatever they, they can. Right. They don't spend any money on marketing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it seems like we are pretty much in agreement this week, except Kung Fu Panda 3. You think yeah. it's going to be the film that's going to rejuvenate the franchise in the US? Yes. Uh, I'm thinking it'll continue that downward spiral, so you're going to slip to around 35 million. My thinking was that this is mostly a film that's focused on the Chinese market because they were releasing it on uh, close to Chinese New Year. Okay. And um, the finest hour, we pretty much agreed, right? Mm. It's going to do Chris Pine numbers, which is around, what, 15 million? That's- you had it a bit lower at 12. Yeah. Yeah, this seems like, um, you know, special effects is not going to really save this movie because, hey, Chris Pine. And then there is Fifty Shades of Black. Another uh, satire from the Wayans Brothers. And this one, we're thinking 8 to 10. Unlike Kung Fu Panda 3, it's not going to rejuvenate the franchise any because uh, I think the spoof game is over with. And um, if they have to pick a movie, they shouldn't probably pick Fifty Shades of Grey, but because there's... Because um, that's, that's a comedy in and of itself. Yes, yes. And uh, you don't need to spoof this thing, you know? <laughs> mm. 
And we're not expecting much from Chain uh, Got a Gun, even though it stars a lot of good people. Sometimes a project gets derailed, and you know, just people just want to get it buried. All right, then that's all for this week. We'll come back. All right, see you guys next week.